Some people might think or say that it is difficult to find a needle in a haystack. Now, would you agree to that? So um, I actually want to start with using your brain. I'm sorry for that. <laughs> uh, so let us imagine that all of us, maybe some of you are, but let's, we are all engineers now, and we're in an engineering, uh, an engineering company, and the boss comes in and says, I have this new, cu uh, this new uh, customer, and he needs, to f he needs to find needles in a haystack, and that's his problem, and you need to solve it. You need to solve it. You need to come up with a strategy of how to do that. How can you find a needle in a haystack? Can I have any suggestions, please? Magnet, magnet, magnet. <laughs> All right, problem solved in one second. So was it that difficult? No. So even seemingly very difficult problems, you can solve sometimes with very easy solutions. But the problem we're tackling, that is my team and the teams I work with in Belgium, they are way, way more difficult than finding a needle in a haystack. Diagnose influenza from human breath. We can expect that persons with influenza, in their normal breathing, that they will breathe out influenza particles, viral particles. And we have reasons to believe that a typical patient may perhaps breathe out one viral particle per breath of air. Yeah? So what we would like to do is to find that particle in that breath of air and identify it as being an influenza virus and as such diagnose the patient. There's only a little problem and that is the virus is very, very small. Actually it's about 100 nanometer across and that's very little. That is about 1000 atoms. And first I want to try to explain to you how small that actually is. So let's compare the problem of finding a virus in a breath of air with that of finding a needle in a haystack. And yes, I am an engineer, so I like to put numbers on things. And so I can try to do that, and I can see if I compare the volume of this viral particle with the three liters of air that you breathe out, compare it to the volume of a needle in a haystack, I see that our problem is roughly 30 billion times more difficult. So to give you an idea actually how small such a particle is, it's hard to say because 100 nanometer we have few, few people of us have actually an idea of how small that is, but what if we would try to actually scale up things? We make everything a thousand times more wide and a thousand times more high and a thousand mo times more deep, so we're one billion times upscaling in volume. Now our three liters of breath that we have become three billion liters of breath. That's huge. And we see actually three billions of liters of breath. That actually that is the volume of the largest indoor space ever built by humans. This is a picture of a Zeppelin hangar in Germany being turned into a tropical holiday park. You can see it has an artificial sea and the little black dots here are actually humans swimming in it. So it's a huge space. Our virus, we have also, also scaled it up one billion times and now actually it becomes as big as the tip of a human hair. So we need to find the tip of a human hair in this huge hole. It's somewhere there. There's one tip of a hair. It can be in the water or in the ceiling. We don't know, but we try to find it. That's the scale of the problem we try to tackle. But with a few clever engineering solutions, we think we can actually do that. This is the instrument that we're trying uh, to tackle it with. And this is a picture also of Gaspar, my former PhD student that made that prototype. I have with me an actual prototype, a more recent one, printed by another PhD student of mine, Lila. And this one is actually tried out in a primary care unit in uh, Belgium. So the idea is that you breathe into this instrument and that this instrument will actually trap the viral particle and detect it as such. So how could we do that? Well, let's take a step back and look at what actually do we breathe out as humans. We breathe out three liters of air. And what is three liters of air that we breathe out? Well, the most of it is just gas. It is nitrogen, it's carbon dioxide, it is water vapor, so they are gases. But also, there are small, tiny aerosol droplets. In every breath of air, typically you have a few tens of thousands or hundred thousands of very tiny droplets of water that you breathe out. They're too small to see, they're only a micrometer in size, so they're really, really small. But the virus, the one virus, in, in, in one of these hundred thousand, there will be likely one virus, and that virus will probably be in that droplet and not in the surrounding gas. So if we can start with collecting all these little droplets together, we have already 
a huge, ups, uh, a huge up concentration has solved a big part of our problem. So that's the first thing we're going to do. Try to collect the aerosol droplets. And how does that work? Let's have a look inside the instrument. If you want, I can in the next break, I, you can have a real look at the real instrument, how it looks like. You will see that in the top of the instrument, you will find one or a number of sharp needles. And these needles we put at a very high voltage, 10 kilovolts. What happens if you put a very sharp object at 10 kilovolt is that the electrons in the tip, really, they're all crammed together and they don't like that, so they jump out and they start ionizing the air around them. And the ions will bounce into everything in the air and very soon the three liters of air that you breathe through this instrument gets ionized. So everything in the air gets charged. So the 100,000 aerosol particles all become charged little water droplets. And they're all at a few thousand volts. And then at the bottom, I have a little holder here. I have one of those in my hands here. It's a few millimeters big. It's a little cage. We call it the cage collector. And in that, we put a little droplet of water, 200 microliter of water. And it's grounded electrically. So all these charged particles flowing down this instrument, they get attracted to this ground. And so they try to fly into, the, into this collector and gets actually absorbed in this little liquid volume. So now what we have done is we have reduced our problem from finding a particle here, a virus particle in a hangar, to finding it in this little vial here. Uh, sorry, from, uh, in from in the three liters into the little uh, 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 collector here. And so if I compare that now, I just need to find my human hair in a volume as big as two standard shipping containers, which is way, way easier than trying to find it in a Zeppelin hangar. Still very difficult. So we have to do some more steps. Next thing we do is, well, let's have a look at the viral particle itself, this 100 nanometer object. It's a beautiful uh, artificially colored picture of such an object. And you see the purple thing in the middle here, that's a nucleic acid. That's actually what uh, determines how the viral particle looks and what creates the, uh, the particle. But you can also see these tiny little brown dots here around this. These are called nucleoproteins. So if I ask my patient to breathe into this instrument for about a minute, I'll likely capture something between 10 and 100 particles. And what I do with this particle is that I break them open. We call that lysis. The, the, the virus break it open and release all the little uh, nucleoproteins that are in the, in the viral particle. And now they are swimming in this liquid volume. So we'll get a 100 virus particles will give us about 100,000 of these nucleoproteins. And so, and these nucleoproteins, they swim around, and these we're going to capture because what we also put in this little vial up front is little bullets, little magnetic beads. These little magnetic beads, they are very small. They're also only 2-3 micrometer size. And they're specially treated. So we have uh, coated those with something that we call an antibody. That's this protein that binds very specifically to these nucleoproteins. So what happens? We have a million of these little beads swimming around here. And I have 100,000 of these nucleoproteins, and I mix it shortly. And what happens, every time a nucleoprotein and a bead meet, they will bind to each other very specifically, and they get stuck, and they don't let go from each other. So very soon, all these nucleoproteins that I had, these 100,000, get bound into one of these 1 million magnetic beads. And what do I do next is that I take these magnetic beads, and I flush them over a surface, a speci specifically made surface. This is a surface made by another student of mine, whose name is Reza. And Reza has very tiny fingers. No, he doesn't, but he makes very tiny wells. <laughs> he makes tiny wells also of the size 2.83 micrometer size. Uh, that is smaller than your blood cells. These are very tiny wells. And so if we flush this liquid over these wells and we put a magnet under here, all these little beads here, they will be sucked down in this well. So I populate every well with a bead. Yeah? And now some, of course, some of these wells have a bead that has a nucleoprotein. But most of them actually have a bead without a nucleoprotein because typically I only would have one bead, uh, uh, 10 beads per nucleoprotein. So I trap them in little wells. And then I can see that these, every little well I can consider as being a biochemical reactor. Yeah? Very tiny one, but basically they're a chemical flask. And now I can do chemistry in every of these wells. Now, by the way, we call this femtoliter wells, a femtoliter well array. What's a femtoliter? You know, you have a liter, milliliter, microliter, nanoliter, picoliter, femtoliter. Yeah? That is a millionth of a billionth of a liter in every well about. But we use them as little uh, chemical uh, reservoirs and we do chemistry on them. And the chemistry we do is that if there is a bead with a nuclear protein, there's a, um, 
catalytic, catalytic reaction going on that turns this well fluorescent. So I let it react, and after the reaction is done, I just put this well plate under a microscope or on top of a microscope, and I simply look which of the wells light up and which do not light up. So every well that lights up has captured a nuclear protein, and the ones that did not light up don't have a nuclear protein. And now I can just simply count how many light, uh, light up wells do I see, so, and then I can calculate back how many viruses did I have. And this information you can then give to a doctor who hopefully can put the diagnose. So what we did is we captured three liter of air in our machine, captured it, the viruses down to a little collector, we uh, lysed the virus, released the nuclear proteins, captured them back on these magnetic beads, seeded them on this, uh, this femtoliter well array, and then looked at the fluorescence, and that gives us the answer. And now, what can we do with this technology? What do we think we will use this actually for? Well, we think there's two main applications when it comes to influenza that we can use this for. The first is companion diagnostics. And companion diagnostics are diagnostics that are specifically for a specific drug. So there are a lot of drugs developed nowadays, antiviral drugs. They can be very expensive. They can cost thousands of dollars per dose. And so before you give such an expensive drug to, to a patient, it will be hopefully, well, you would only give it to very severely ill patients that has a risk of dying. And then you want to know, does that patient really have influenza? And then perhaps our test can find that out before you give the drug. Another um, example where we can use it and where the pharma companies are very interested in is in the triage of, uh, for clinical trials. So when you develop novel drugs, first you have your compounds that you sort out. First you're going to test them on cell cultures. After that on mice, maybe on another animal on a few humans, and if everything goes fine in every step, you come to the step where you need to try it out on a larger population in a clinical trial. And these clinical trials, they tend to be hugely expensive. People from the pharma industry tell me that per patient they enroll in such a trial, it costs them $50,000. Mm? Now you need to know that one trial can need 1,000, 2,000, 3,000 persons. So what they would like to have is for people with respiratory infections, before they enroll them in this trial, if they could have this quick test here and actually determine does the patient really have influenza, yes or no, before I enroll them and I have this huge cost. Huh? Good. Well, I hope I have showed you that with our micro and nanotechnology, we're actually solving problems that seem impossible but are not really impossible to solve. I hope I showed you how that is possible. And I want to thank actually all my collaborators in Belgium and in here in Sweden. And I want to thank you, the audience, for your patience. <laughs>